was asked to um, give just a quick overview of technology from a, a geek's perspective. We're like the plumbers of the IT industry, not very glamorous. I put my contact information at the beginning of the presentation, so while I eat my lunch, I get to see what people really think about the presentation. Um, I looked up this morning what the code on Twitter was, and that is the code for sh uh, linking all the conversations. Um, and uh, my Twitter tag, uh, for those of you that want to carry on, um, the conversation afterwards. So really quickly, I'm just going to go through, um, give you a little background. I am so excited. <laughs> That's the goal of my presentation. I don't want to tell you why. First of all, I'm a geek. I'm not a nerd or a dork. And as you can see how they overlap, okay? I'm obsessed with technology. I've got some intelligence around it. Dweebs also have intelligence, a little social ineptitude. Geeks are really what you, we represent what you will be doing in five years. So. You know, and predicting the future is easy. It is. Predicting when the future occurs, that's the hard part. And I was born in 1969. Not that 1969. That 1969. <laughs> and, and that 1969, if you want to know where our uniforms come from, it's homage to NASA. Like, those geeks were wearing a uniform, they just didn't know it. And that's what we do. We tend to propagate ideas unconsciously, like, that is more efficient with a short sleeve shirt. You can draw a direct correlation to everything that's happening today, from the founding of Google and uh, Microsoft and Apple and everything in the internet to, I think, the moon landing, which kind of kicked things off, um, you know, and everything that's happened since then. Uh, you know, the first processor in 71, I always include this because it's still a huge impact on my life. It <laughs> It's in it, 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 I mean, Steve Jobs is probably the closest living person we have to a Willy Wonka. It's a movie about CEO succession. Um, so. <laughs> 1976, Star Wars. Now, Star Wars figures still very prominently because those of us that are grown up and even have children now, um, you know, we all saw ourselves as Luke Skywalker on a journey. And most geeks, the problem with us is that we're all dressed up with no place to go. We get out of the movie theater watching The Matrix and we're ready to take on the big brother. Uh, and unfortunately, we go back to our normal dreary lives, waiting for that mission to come. And I think, to be honest, this summer, um, with the elections in Iran, uh, I don't know if you know, but one interesting thing that happened was that um, people, um, obviously, the government can use social media just as very easily um, to track people as uh, they can use to speak out. And so one interesting thing that happened this summer was that um, people very quickly, within hours, we were able to rally saying, change your Twitter city location to Tehran. So when the police are looking for who's Twittering from Tehran, um, it's like we hid everybody in the crowd with us. And I just thought that was awesome. Um, and Orwell was kind of half right. There are cameras everywhere. They're just in everybody's pockets, aimed at the government. So for really, this year, and thanks to Twitter and some other things, for the first time, um, we see ourselves as kind of being able to um, partake for real um, outside the movie theater, but don't underestimate um, inspiration. Uh, you know, and a direct correlation from, and this is my first video game, the Atari. Um, this is Ward Christensen, who created the first bulletin board system, which is a precursor to the internet, and actually in the suburbs of Chicago where I grew up. He had to actually build his own com computer, write the software, um, and then there's William Shatner advertising the first computer for the masses, the Commodore VIC-20, which I got when I was a kid. And there we are sitting around the family spreadsheet. <laughs> War games. Again, these images are training us actually in childhood. You could almost look at this as a government program to train young kids to be interested in science and math. Th uh, thanks to all the movies that came out. And the point of all this is once the computers could talk to each other and everybody saw the computer revolution in the 80s, some people uh, saw the uh, internet revolution uh, come Macintosh made it easier, but this is what changed it for me. 1991. Um, this is the first, like the world's first webcam. It was the famous coffee pot at Cambridge University, and I remember showing everybody, going, "Check it out," <laughs> and they're like, "What? It, what is it?" I'm like, "It's a coffee pot. It's an empty coffee pot." And only a geek would hook up a camera and write software, so he wouldn't have to walk. Uh, halfway down the building, only to know that that stupid coffee pot had nobody made coffee. <laughs> this is the problem with geeks. We don't know how to package ourselves. We don't know how to do it, but we can see the future. Um, and when we saw the ability to connect things low cost, real time, that was super exciting. And so the 90s really were about computers talking to each other. 
And uh, at the University here in Minnesota, Gopher was a precursor to the World Wide Web. And right around this time, Linux was the first um, you know, open source operating system. Linus Torvalds was uh, still a student at this time, and it was super exciting. And uh, the first web browser, Mark Andreessen, who had found Netscape, was still a student at the University of Illinois. And so it's like we kept seeing, this is right around the time those AT&T commercials were showing on TV. Like, have you ever driven through a tow booth without stopping? You will. And if you, they're on YouTube now, and they're hilarious to watch. Like, half of it has come in true, have come true only just now, and, and half of it were just silly to begin with. Um, anyway, um, so Geek Squad, you could almost, almost predicted that it, it would come around. And the idea is that the normal people were only just getting their email addresses in the 90s. Um, anyway, that was my phone at the time. Uh, and then a couple years later, I think I got this Nextel phone. It was like a walkie-talkie, which was a lot of fun to talk on. And then last year, um, this is probably the most significant thing. This is, this is why I'm excited. Um, you know, Star Wars was fun, and video games were great in the 80s, and computers were fun and somewhat useful in the 90s. Um, but up in, you know, in the 80s, you could buy any computer and use it on any network and use it with any monitor, and there was a standard. But uh, up until last year, you couldn't use any phone, use it on any network, install any application you wanted. And let me tell you, um, you know, Android is an operating system uh, that Google is sponsoring as an open source. It runs on Linux, so it builds on what happened in the 90s with open source. But what's so exciting about this is that it's going to unlock, I believe, the kind of the final frontier. You know, the first decade of the 20th century, uh, 21st century, was Wi-Fi. Computers beginning to move about 100 yards away from that wall connection. Uh, but now, um, last year, this year, and really starting off next year, um, it feels like the last 40 years are all coming to a head where normal people will have high speed in their pocket. Um, and uh, so, and it'll do am amazing things. Like this is a program that runs on Android. It uses the um, GPS chip to calculate how many calories you're burning during the day. Um, and uh, it also uses the pedometer, that thing that rotates the screen, can also act as a pedometer to keep track of the number of steps you take if you're inside a building. Um, it, these kind of things are going to transform what we think of as a phone. And my daughter's 11 and doesn't even use her voice minutes uh, anymore. Then far out, crazy stuff is going to happen. Just this year, um, the most, this, is, this is the 2009 version of that first webcam from 1991. And this is called augmented reality. Um, you're going to see this more and more. Basically, it uses your camera's cell phone as a browser. Uh, I think what makes this interesting is how we consume content, where and when, is going to be very interesting. This is one where you can look up restaurants if you're in Amsterdam and wave it around. And it'll, you can say within a half mile or a mile. Um, the interface, though, is what's significant. And it's simple and it's intuitive. You don't have to be a geek to use it. Most geeks are a little bit, um, uh, well, initially were nervous when normal people started using technology like this. They were worried they'd have a job, but now they realize they can make money selling it to you. But one of the implications I see of this that haven't been uh, realized yet is that you'll be able to, you'll have like, um, you talked about classes that might be taught by a dead professor. Uh, I see artists creating works um, where you're walking in Spain and the author has left a note that you only would be able to pull up on your phone if you were in that vicinity. To stand where Monet stood, to paint the uh, haystacks uh, near his home in Givernay. Um, all sorts of new exploratory uh, things. A lot of people, initial prediction is that this means that so when I'm walking around like Starbucks is just going to incessantly pummel me with useless ads. Not at all. Nobody's going to last doing that. Um, but imagine letting your phone talk to Amazon to know what books you read and which ones you really love and letting it talk to Facebook so it knows um, which movie you just saw and you really like and it, it you let your phone and the, and the system learn more about you that you only have access to with it but it knows that you like architecture or certain kinds of art or certain kinds of music and you're able to keep track of a greater volume of information um, with much less actual interruption. Um, the future the real, the real value is going to be um, the power of filtering. And that's how we'll overcome this mass quantity of information. You'll actually be interrupted very little. You'll, be able, you'll have a lot of control over it. 
and again, privacy will freak people out uh, about as much as uh, some of the new genetic technology, but it eventually it will get it will get there. There's really, uh, one way to summarize it up is there's really only four screens that we are planning on as the plumbers of the future to support. Uh, of course, the, m the mobile phone is the main event. I mean, it, it is the computer. Uh, everything else is just a, just a piece of glass uh, that connects to a network. Um, we're all waiting for the tablet uh, in 2010. Um, I want one in the kitchen. I, won't, I wouldn't mind one having here today. The only problem with tablets are they'll have a keyboard that will just slide up on the screen like on your phone. Uh, I think the main problem for that will be um, how you hold it on the plane and like if you watch a movie. Uh, so not having a hinge may be a problem. But that's essentially the same as a desktop and a laptop. Uh, but I just don't think you're going to be storing anything on this piece of glass in the future. Of course, the flat screens. The first flat screens next year are going to have internet connections. And so you'll install Skype on the living room television. There'll be no more set-top boxes very soon. Uh, there'll be a couple for a while that, like, uh, now Netflix uh, was installed in my, my Blu-ray player. But very soon you'll install apps onto a TV. Televisions are just going to become basically 35 to 45-inch large iPod touches. And, uh, and then there's, of course, the in-car system. When you buy a car in the future, I think they're going to ask you, do you want Mac or PC or Google? People ask me if I'm Mac or PC. I, I say I'm Google. I'm, you know, I mean, I have an Apple laptop, but I only like it really for the shape of it and the magnetic plug. But I don't belong to an operating system anymore. Um, and I just don't see the car companies uh, advancing it that much. So anyway, those are the, I don't, see any other major form factors emerging. And I think we're finally going to get our, our last major one with the tablet in this next year. And that'll move people even faster. If I had only had advice for the manufacturers in the last couple of years, it would be like if you had just made Windows Vista boot twice as fast and crash half as often, you probably would have sold 10 times as much. Um, I don't know what will happen. Will geeks be needed in the future? Um, you know, I thought I asked that question. What will happen if computers don't crash? Uh, as Bill Gates was demonstrating Windows 95 in McCormick Place in Chicago all those years ago. And then Windows 98 came out. And then Windows 98 Second Edition came out. As long as there's innovation, there'll be uh, a kind of need for this stuff. But the good news for you is it's going to get easier, and we'll, f we'll find something to do. Uh, real quickly, this is just the tablets specifically. Uh, Michael Arrington, who's, who's a journalist, is going to have a really interesting problem. He's been talking about designing his own, running uh, open source. And uh, Michael Arrington's going to have an interesting problem. As a journalist, he's going to have, who's going to review his product? Um, and it's been delayed or whatever. Um, I think this is going to become kind of like the One Laptop Per Child project from MIT. I believe that uh, by the time any well-meaning organization will come out with it, uh, the, the, the marketplace will rapidly come out with one. These are pretty practically disposable. In fact, I predict many of the media companies here will be giving these away in exchange for some kind of a subscription. And uh, as a geek and as an online person, I can't wait to read uh, a lot of the newspapers online on a larger screen. Uh, than on my mobile phone. So um, this is what the rumored Apple one looks like, and there's not really a lot of difference. I mean, it's going to be a, a sliver of glass. Eventually, that glass will be plastic, so you can crack it, bend it, not worry about it, and it'll be pretty much indestructible. But, and Android is an interesting trend I also recommend you, you look at because uh, I love Apple's design, but the openness of Android Speaking of Darwinism, I just uh, I think by next year, it's not that Android I is an iPhone killer. It's Android and iPhone are going to make life difficult for everybody else. But it's really good news for you because the prices are going to plummet and um, there'll be a huge amount of choice. Very exciting. And I'm just going to wrap it up there.